Hi, my name is Meg Truitt. I'm a nurse practitioner with Nebraska Medicine. I'd like to welcome you here today for expert uh, perspectives on CDK inhibitors. I have uh, two colleagues with me today, Dr. Ruth O'Regan and uh, Austin Kirshner, who will be discussing not only the mechanism of action of these uh, new class of drugs, but also the um, how we, we work with our patients and, and discuss with them uh, the safety and, and dosing of, of these drugs. So we'll start with you, Dr. O'Regan. Uh, welcome. Uh, can you tell me just a little bit about uh, this new class of drug, uh, the CDK uh, inhibitors, and, and why are they so important in the metastatic breast cancer world? Well, I think the issue here is that obviously about two-thirds of breast cancers are estrogen receptor positive. And although we do cure many patients, unfortunately, some patients do develop metastatic disease. And we know that for patients with metastatic hormone receptor positive disease, the endocrine therapies tend to work for a while, but then they stop working. And that's because the cancer cells become resistant to these agents. Okay. So we really need new therapies like the CDK inhibitors to improve outcome for patients with hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. And if you like, enhance the endocrine therapy that we give them. So the CDK4-6 inhibitors are a pretty new class of drugs that basically affect the cell cycle in a manner where they basically shut down the cell cycle at G1, and in that way they prevent cancer cells multiplying. Okay, great, thanks. And so Austin, how would you go about um, talking about that mechanism of action to your patients? It's obviously pretty complex. Um, how do you break that down for our patients? So um, a lot of times what I'll do is, you know, just like any nursing intervention, you have to assess um, how ready to learn your patient is and what their level of sophistication is. So okay. if I have a patient who um, wants to know everything and demands to know everything, you know, I'll go to the uh, package insert and I'll show them the molecule and, you know, we'll talk about that. Um, but if I have a, one of your more common patients who just um, wants to know what it does, I'll tell them that this uh, stops the cancer cells from growing in a perfect world if it works. Mm -hmm. um, and generally um, has been shown in the clinical trials to um, double survival. So people wow. like hearing that. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So, okay, so we know that there is uh, currently just one FDA approved um, drug in this class of drug. Are there anything, uh, any other drugs on the horizon? Yeah, so palbociclib is the one that's approved, and it's approved in both the first line and the pretreated setting. So we have an option of where we give that drug to patients. Um, but there are two in development, ribocyclob, which has been marketed by Novartis, that's in phase three studies, and also bemocyclob, which has been developed by Lilly, which is also in phase two and three studies. A bemocyclob, there will be some data from that at ASCO this year, um, and it's the only one that's been looked at as a single agent without endocrine therapy, so that could be kind of interesting. They do differ a little bit in their side effect profile. For example, for example a bemocyclob has less effect on the white blood count but causes more diarrhea, so okay. you know, we won't, you never really know how these drugs mm -hmm. are going to act up until you actually treat patients. I'm sure Austin would agree with right. that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things where, um, you know, the, the neutropenias and those are uh, the most common side effect of palbociclib, but um, we definitely do run across some more um, side effects that maybe you wouldn't expect. Um, and that's why, you know, I always counsel my patients to uh, call if anything feels like it's not right. Uh, not, okay. Don't follow the list of side effects and expect them. If you feel like you're having anything going on, that's when I need you to pick up the phone. Okay. I think that's a very good point, though, because Absolutely. the clinical trials are a very controlled setting in some right. ways. Mm -hmm. um, but in real life, you very often find things you weren't expecting with these drugs. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because I. How many <laughs> patients have you had that they just look at that list of side effects and it's like, it's check, almost check, like they check. do it. Yeah, check mark. Right. <laughs> it's like, no, we don't. We really don't need to do that. So, um, you had mentioned the other uh, drugs in this class. Um, how close are they to being on the market? Well, I think it depends what the results of these large phase three studies look like. Um, but I think they all look like they're going to bring something to the table. So I would be pretty hopeful that within the next 12 months to maybe 24 months, at least one of them will wow. be approved. So um, we can certainly hope for that. Obviously, it depends on the, the patient population you're looking at in the trials because 
the patients who've had prior endocrine therapy, those trials tend to report earlier than the trials in the first line setting. So that's what we'll kind of watch for. It's going to be interesting, okay. though, because you're going to have to say, are they better than palbociclib? Are they less mm -hmm. toxic? All you know, it'll be back to the good old days with the three aromatase inhibitors, right. probably. Oh, yeah. So, right. yeah. Uh, kind of dealer's choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so Austin, can you um, tell me what your experience is in, in talking with your patients about not only the side effect profile, but also um, managing an oral medication? It seems like folks don't seem to take um, oral medications right. quite as seriously as something that is uh, through the vein. It's, it's just a pill. How important could that be? Right. So, you know, it, it depends on the patient. If um, it's a patient that's been on letrozole for three years, um, they know the drill. You know, if, if they've been on um, an AI for that long uh, and they're still alive, uh, they've probably been taking it faithfully. Um, if it's someone who is uh, a new to therapy of any kind, um, you know, I will talk about the neutropenias and the importance of getting their CBCs on time uh, and the importance of taking their pills every day. So um, depending on what someone's home setting is like, uh, using strategies like uh, keeping their medication at bedside, which mm -hmm. is great if you don't have any uh, kids or dogs that like to eat things. Um, or uh, if you have patients who are just not good at remembering um, to take anything, sometimes I'll talk to the physician and say, hey, I don't know if you know this, but this patient is um, wildly non-compliant with pretty much everything that they take. Um, so we really need to think about some different options for this patient. And you know, there are some out there. You can um, encourage people to go buy their old lady pill box hey, or old easy, man pill easy, box. Easy. Uh, I've got one of those. So. You know, and that helps caregivers to look, have a visual um, of what their loved one has been taking. Okay. And if they come in and see uh, they missed day four, they missed day seven, they missed 11 and 14, maybe this isn't the right agent for them. Okay, okay. You know, I found um, personally that there's usually about three reasons why folks are not compliant with their um, medications. And one is they can't afford it. Right. Um, two, the side effects. Or three, that they forget. Right. And so I think it's really important to touch base with the patients on all three counts at every visit. Right. So. And I think, you know, especially, you know, where we practice, I think we're very fortunate to have um, an interdisciplinary team that works um, on the affordability of the medication. Right. So, um, you know, if we need to wrangle insurance companies, we can do that. If we need um, to get the drug companies involved and find um, either patient assistance right. or a free drug, um, the drug companies have been very good at um, providing it for patients that truly need the drug. Um, but if it's someone that just isn't going to pay their copay because they don't want to pay their copay, um, you know, yeah. then a lot of times it's uh, more of a encouraging them to um, look at the benefit, you know, going back to the clinical trial and saying, you know, what is an extra, you know, two times survival worth to you? Mm -hmm. And then the copay doesn't seem as high. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. a great perspective. I think um, <clears throat> compliance in the metastatic setting is higher than it is in the adjuvant setting. But one thing that I, I've kind of been talking to you know, some of the electronic medical record companies about is, is there a way that you could measure compliance better using those, like at least know whether patients are actually filling their prescriptions, for example, because right. I've had, I had a patient who told me she took tamoxifen for five years. She never took one pill of it. Oh my. And she only told me five years later. Wow. So she did okay, but you know, still that's not what she right. was. She's lucky. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, okay. and you know, in your electronic medical records, you can, um, you know, look and see if um, the prescriptions have been filled and all this type of thing, but you can't tell if they filled it and they've got a stockpile at home. Um, so that's where you involve the caregivers, mm -hmm. you know, have you, have you gone to mom's house to see if she really is taking this, especially, you know, your cantankerous people? Um, and sometimes you'll find out interesting answers. Um, had one lady who took it every other day instead of every day because she read the side effects and she just didn't, didn't want any of those. So it's okay. interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing what you find out when you ask. Right. So. People are very unpredictable. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, finally, what's most exciting to you about this class of drugs? So I, I think the mechanism of action is clearly very interesting. And I think the toxicity profile really is very favorable. So they, they'd be the two key things because I think, you know, as we talked about earlier, for patients with metastatic breast cancer, you want to make them live as long as possible, but their quality of life is incredibly important. Right. So our goal has to be to give them the least toxic agents um, that will help them. And I, I think that's where we are with these agents. Um, I, I do think that there are still maybe patients that could do, do well without endocrine therapy, in, or sorry, without uh, CDK inhibitor in the first line setting and just endocrine therapy. But right now, we don't have a biomarker that really tells us right. who those patients are. Right. Okay. But I think that would, be an, that would be a very interesting area to look at because we know palbociclib works first line and second line. So the question is, where do you place it? Right. And then what do you do when, when patients have disease progression through these drugs? Mm -hmm. you know, do you right. use a different one? Do you use the same one? Do you use Everolimus? Yeah, is is there a, a place for it yeah, still? Yeah, a lot know? of questions unanswered. Absolutely. But at least we have, you know, I think over the past three years, two very good agents approved for this type of breast cancer. And hopefully we'll get a lot more soon. Okay, right. great. Well, I, you know, we've had a great discussion here. I think um, we've touched on a lot of interesting points. Uh, we know that this is a new class of drug and we've talked about the mechanism of action and why it's unique and why it was needed. And also, most importantly, is that we can actually double uh, the progression-free survival in our metastatic breast cancer patients, which, you know, is really exciting. This is not um, the treatments that we had 20 plus years ago. Even this, five years ago. Even five, five years, years ago. ago. You know, this is, uh, we're talking about um, uh, chronic illness here and in some degree. And, you know, sometimes when you put it in that perspective for patients, you know, while they may be on treatment, that this is their new reality. That's the way it is with other chronic illnesses too. Right. So right. I, I, I'm very excited about this. And it is, it is exciting. Um, you know, uh, coming from a hospice and palliative care background, wow. um, a lot of times at, in that world, whenever I would see stage four cancer of any kind, I would say, well, they need to be on hospice. Now that I've been on the oncology world, right. um, you know we have stage four breast cancer patients who've been stage four for 15 years, right? Um, and have had intervention after intervention after intervention, um, but they're still alive and their quality and of life is pretty it's good. It's actually pretty good, yeah. and you know, and what's what's um, survival ship time if you don't have good quality of life? Right. You know. Yeah. So. It's basically living with the disease, mm -hmm. right. which thankfully a lot of them can do now, which as you right. say, they weren't able to do before. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, th thank you for watching our expert perspectives on CDK inhibitors in the metastatic breast cancer setting.